Good morning, everybody. We are uh, still missing one speaker in action, but we thought we should start already, and uh, um, she can join as and when. The channel that we'll use for the headphones is two, it seems. You're on one. one, one. So. Well, I'm on two, so that's very bizarre. Try one or two. <laughs> um, my name is Anja Kovac. I uh, work with the Internet Democracy Project in Delhi. Um, and I would like to, first of all, give you a very well, warm welcome here early in the morning uh, in Baku, Azerbaijan. I think the question we want to address today has relevance for the situation in this country as well. Um, the workshop kind of came out of the observation that there is a growing inclination on the part of governments to interfere in the internet. I think that tendency has been given some attention for quite a while when it comes to more authoritarian countries, but we increasingly see that this is the case in democracies as well. For a long time, I guess, the fact that democracies wanted to do this wasn't really seen as problematic because somehow there was an assumption that the criminal law in democratic societies, by definition, would be uh, more or less unproblematic, I guess. Increasingly, it's clear that that is not the case. We, uh, my organization is doing a study in India that looks at how the translation of criminal law that pre-existed the internet, how the translation on the internet actually leads to a stifling of freedom of expression that didn't ha uh, happen earlier. Uh, colleagues from Nepal and Bangladesh are doing the same kind of study in their country. One of my colleagues is in the room, Baburam from uh, ISOG in Nepal. Um, so I guess that is one dimension of the whole uh, problem. Uh, but the other issue is that even if that criminal law is accept acceptable as such, increasingly we do see that there is a real tension between applying those laws consistently on the internet as one would have done before and maintaining the free and global internet that we all hold so close. And so it seemed as if it was time to get more into the debate of what exactly are then the, the challenges that we are facing here, and what are ways in which we can resolve this tension, or perhaps solutions are, are too ambitious to aim for, but at least alleviate it, and in some way find productive ways to go forward. Um, our workshop today will be broken into several parts. We will have three sections. The first one will be smaller and then two somewhat bigger se sections. And I will take one or two questions after each uh, section. And different speakers will address the different uh, questions as and when they have comments. I'm very happy to have a very rich group of speakers in this workshop today. Um, let me start from my very right and your left with uh, Ella Flynn, who is the head of public policy for Google in uh, New Zealand and Australia. Just next to me is Moes Chakchuk, uh, the CEO of the Tunisian Internet Agency. Paul Failinger from the Internet and Jurisdiction Pro uh, Project. And to my very left, uh, Carlos Cortez for the Center for the Study of Freedom of Expression and Access to Information at the University of Palermo in Argentina. Uh, the person who we hope is still coming, I hope nothing bad happened to her, is Gillian York, who is the Director of International Freedom of Expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I would like to start um, by just asking this broad question of why does the internet actually pose a challenge to the application of criminal law in different countries and what are kind of the histories and the sensitivities to lead to that problem? And maybe a good way to get into that conversation is uh, uh, by looking at the innocence of Muslim videos which, ha which had such a different treatment in different parts of the world. Um, Irla, Google has been very intimately confronted with some of those contradictions. What was your experience of that whole uh, discussion? Um, <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Um, this was a pretty um, 
uh, difficult and uh, and complex uh, situation um, uh, dealing with the innocence of Muslims uh, video, which which appeared on YouTube recently. Um, the first thing I want to say is that. You know, our view is that we, we want YouTube uh, to be a community that everybody can, can enjoy as well as a genuine platform uh, for free expression. And those are the, the values um, that we hold very, very dear. But this can create challenges because what's okay in one country can be deeply offensive um, in, in another country. Um, uh, on YouTube, we have a system of community guidelines, which is essentially a set of policies for uh, what is okay and not okay uh, on YouTube. Um, and um, the system operates on the basis of complaints. So if a person sees a video they don't like, they can flag that video, it will be reviewed, and if it breaches the community guidelines, it will be taken down from YouTube globally. Um, the Innocence of Muslims video uh, was found not to breach uh, those uh, guidelines. Um, and I don't know, who, who, who has actually seen the video? Has anybody in the audience seen this video? Okay, not many. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, and I'd be interested to hear people's uh, reactions to it, but, but we did make the decision it did not breach the, the, the guidelines. Um, um, so that's point number one, but there's also the framework of law in, in different countries. Um, and for countries where we have a local YouTube domain, where we've launched YouTube, uh, if we receive a valid uh, court order or, or other uh, proper legal um, order, we will block uh, that video in that country um, <clears throat> and uh, this is what happened for example in Indonesia and India those those processes went went on uh, and the video is blocked in those countries but, but for, for, for countries where we have not launched uh, YouTube locally so it's on the dot com domain uh, we will not block um, videos um, in response to legal requests in, in the normal course however um, we're very very sensitive to the safety of the public uh, and if we do have um, credible information uh, that a particular video is um, uh, creating, uh, you know, an imminent risk to human life, uh, then I think we're faced with a quandary. Uh, and in those kind of exceptional situations, um, we are prepared to block in, in a country. And, and that is the situation uh, that developed here in uh, Egypt and Libya, for example. So we did temporarily block the video in, in those countries that it's since uh, unblocked. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's, it's good to kick off with this because in a way it's a good case study of, of the difficulties um, that on the one hand an open and global internet, which is uh, what we feel very passionately about, uh, can clash uh, with local uh, community uh, views and norms and, and indeed uh, laws. Uh, these can be very complex um, decisions um, and uh, can be hard to make the right call, but uh, I think that's, that's a good example and a good recent example of the kind of issues that, that we face with, so happy to come back further on that. Well, Moes, from, from the perspective of the Tunisian government, would you agree that that was handled well? <laughs> No, for sure, for sure. I, I think that um, in Tunisia, as well as in different other Arab countries and in the region, we dislike these videos. But this is not the only video that harmed us. It's not the old, it, it's not, it, would, it won't be the last video that will also make us in a, in a bad, bad situation in terms of um, uh, blocking or not the contents. We have faced different contents in, in YouTube and in Facebook during a year since the revolution. We have faced blocking pornography, we have faced blocking a lot of pages in Facebook. And this, all those issues showed us that we, we don't need to block anything. We don't need to block because when we block, we, 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 we increase the popularity of this content. I really dislike these videos as well as different other contents in the internet, but that, has mean, that, that, that doesn't give reason for the government or for a court or whatever, or for a lawyer to, to, to claim for, to block any content on the internet. We know that in Tunisia, uh, everyone in Tunisia should understand that there is no freedom without being responsible. And uh, responsibility comes with maturity and that requires education. This is the key issue, I think. We need to educate people about how to deal with those contents. It's not a matter of they saying, okay, we need Google to block any content in YouTube to be, to be able to not to be offended on the internet. It's not a real solution, as well as for pornography. We, we don't like the pornography for, for sure, but we defended that Tunis the internet in Tunisia remains open and 
uh, free for any uh, filtering process. You know that the agency, I mean, CEO for, of, of it, is, uh, has, has a long history in blocking content, so we know very well how to deal with these issues, and we don't want to be backwards to those uh, things. Thank you. Moritz, if I can ask a follow-up question. Yes. Um, do you feel then that Google should have pushed back more in uh, Egypt and Libya where they did not have a court order? <laughs> I think that Google is in the wrong way to deal with those issues. I'm frankly speaking, I, I think that Google cannot really decide in our, in, uh, in our, um, decide whether to block or not according to a court order. A lot of Tunisians don't, don't agree that Google or, or Facebook or Twitter or whatever take to control of some content in order to protect ourselves. We are mature and we need to be mature to, in order to, to say, okay, if we need to block, we can apply for, for example, parental control softwares or whatever. No, but not, not Google to, to block in or, or Facebook to, to block in a global manner. So you're saying even when there is a court order? Even when uh, there is a court okay. order. And we try to avoid that we have court orders asking for blocking. We try to, to, sensi sensi to, to sensibilize what I say, yeah. uh, the, the judges to not order it, the blocking things because it's not feasible first and other thing is not real solution for those contents. It's uh, clearly a very clearly a very different perspective coming from a government here which is interesting I think. Um, is there maybe at this point a, a question from the floor or a comment before we move into the issue of the, the bigger challenges? Now this is going to be tough. <laughs> Let me ask Nigat first and then uh, Guy, you'll get the floor as well, but if you could both keep it brief, that would be great. Can we have a mic, please? Hi, uh, my name is Nikat. I'm from Pakistan. I work for an organization, Digital Rights Foundation. Um, it's been three months now that YouTube has been blocked in Pakistan. Um, my question from Google is that uh, why they have temporarily, temporarily blocked this video in Tunisia and Egypt? And why, sorry, in Libya and Egypt, and why they didn't respond to Pakistani government? I'm not asking that, I'm not in a favor of blocking content. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to know the process they adopted. Uh, this one thing. Another thing that you said that you had, a, like Google had a fear of losing lives, and that's the reason that you temporarily blocked it. In Pakistan, due to that video, seven people were killed. So why there is a discrimination in, in this process. Uh, and I mean, we are in a limbo. We, uh, we, we are asking our government to unblock it. They are not doing it. And it is actually giving so much power to the government to block you know, content on, in Pakistan. It, and the blocking and censorship, ad hoc blocking and censorship is so common in Pakistan. And we have no idea that who, who to contact with. Google is not responding. Pakistani government is not responding. So where the internet users go and, you know, ask for the grievance. So that's my question. Thank you so much. I think some of the uh, later points about where users go will, address, will be addressed later as well, but it's already interesting to see a government uh, request Google to intervene less and an activist ask, why didn't you <laughs> intervene in our country? Ila, just before you respond, maybe Guy can ask his question as well and then um, we can take them both at the same time. Uh, 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 thank you. I'm Guy Berger from UNESCO. I just want to ask a technical question. Uh, are either of you or anybody else aware of um, circumvention technologies to get around the, the, the YouTube ban uh, to actually see the video in, in these countries where it was uh, either blocked or, uh, by the government or by uh, Google itself? Uh. On the circumvention technology, I, I, I don't know in, in, in that particular case. Of course, we all know that, that such technologies are, are widely available uh, and, and people do use them. Um, I, I often think that, um, uh, that that avenue is open to people who are um, you know, more technically expert and who understand how these technologies work, but are probably not uh, a solution for if I can call it the average or typical uh, internet user who, who will not have that level of expertise. So I, 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 I believe uh, that does go on. It goes on in many countries which have uh, censorship systems. Um, 
Uh, and I've also heard yesterday that, that governments are starting to, to focus on this and uh, develop technologies and programs to block uh, th those kind of... Uh, so we're into sort of a game of cat and mouse. I, I will try and find out more, more details for you. Um, uh, in response to the, the questions about Pakistan, um, look, that's, um, that's a, very, uh, a very tough situation. And, um, you know, we're, we're faced with, with dealing with these things in real time, I I if you like. A situation is developing. Uh, we're doing our best to try and get information uh, from the ground about what's actually happening. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to establish a link uh, between a particular video uh, you know, is contributing or is a big factor in a particular situation on the ground. And people may uh, claim there's a clear linkage, uh, and that may be true or, or it may not be true. It can be difficult. Um, I, I wasn't involved directly on the ground, so I, I um, uh, don't have that specific information. Maybe we can talk later about it. But as I understand it, the, the view from uh, our people on the ground uh, and different contacts we have uh, was that the situation in, in Egypt and Libya was, was slightly different to um, Pakistan. You, you may disagree with that, but I think that those, those were the drivers. Um, and you're right, of course, what's happened is YouTube is blocked uh, in Pakistan. Uh, we're frustrated by that. Um, all the people who, who use YouTube, I would imagine, are, are frustrated also. It's not a good situation, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult. What, what is the, the path out of this? Um, uh, should YouTube just block this video uh, and, uh, and have the service restored? Or is it possible to, um, uh, to, to work with the government and others to try to um, uh, resolve the situation? Um, not easy to, to navigate your way through these things, um, but I think we, we do believe that there are situations where um, uh, you know, blocking material um, in certain situations will get us on a path where we will end up um, uh, censoring very, very heavily. Um, and, and sometimes we believe we have to draw the line. Uh, similar situations apply in other countries. We've had a long-running uh, situation in Turkey, for example, where YouTube was blocked for a long, long time. Uh, similar situations in China. So uh, I think none of these are black and white cases. They're very hard calls to make. And um, very interested to hear more from, from the audience and the panel on, on, on the right way to, to navigate through. But, but that was the situation in, uh, in Pakistan, which we felt was, was slightly different to the other countries. Uh, comment for Google, and you know that YouTube have been blocked for years in Tunisia by ITI, and this is just because one of two videos talking about the, about our dictature. So, after the revolution, the last decision of, of Bin Ali was to say, "Okay, we open YouTube," before he flew out to the country. So, YouTube, I think, is something that we need to be uh, remained open for all countries. Thank you. I think what this uh, setting of the context has already done is just show how complex this is uh, from different perspectives and different local contexts. Um, Carlos, could you perhaps uh, say a little bit more about what, where exactly do these challenges come from here and, and why is this so much of a problem? Um, thank you, Anja. <clears throat> well, I, I think that the, the most important challenge to bear in mind here is that criminal law in a general sense, whether if it's to tackle copyright infringement or to tackle the problems of, of the case we were just discussing, ends up working in the digital environment as an, in, as an incentive towards closeness and control. It's, it's an, an, immediate, an immediate effect of this sort of, of regulation. So if we're talking about the open internet and criminal law, I think we have to start from the point of how is criminal law driving changes in the internet, both in the code and in the content layer, because it's clear that a, a law, any kind of regulation will end up driving the way coding is done and will have a direct impact in the digital environment that we use. Um, this is a concept, an interesting concept that's done, that some authors have explored that is sometimes called architectures of control which is also sometimes called architectures of confidence, um, where there are configurations that end up defining to a very detailed fashion what a person can do online. Um, and we see it specifically in the 
in the structures or regimes, regimes of authorization where I have to have my identification, where I have to clearly be what I am in my face in the real life. I have to be the same person in the, in my, in the digital world. So um, I think that's a huge challenge for the open internet. We're facing not only just a separate uh, group of, of laws that end up impacting conduct, but we are enabling a totally different environment of social conduct online. And I would take it from there to say that it's uh, a challenge that cannot be analyzed case by case. Um, I presume that has uh, very important consequences then um, for users. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about those as well, um, Carlos? Um, there's there's a diff there's an int there's an interesting thing about what what how this ends up impacting users because uh, we're many times just focusing on what on what uh, the internet is not allowing us to do. So we talk about the changes in the internet. So I cannot access YouTube now, or I cannot access this service as I can as I was able to do it some time ago. We nowadays cannot download music. Of, some of us did it 10 years ago. I mean, people did a party or did a whole record with Napster songs. But there's an important issue to bear in mind about what's, what the conducts are being enabled to do. I mean, what is this new environment allowing, allowing us or more or less incentiv incentivizing us to do? And I think there's a challenge over the normalization of certain conducts. So to the extent that we are identified users, to the extent that we feel monitored, to the extent that we have to uh, respond or to bear in mind serious legal challenges or risks, we are going to start driving us to certain kind of conducts that are more or less expected from us. So perhaps we are going to uh, think about what searches we are doing in, a, in a, an application as Google. We are start to see exactly what's our history in, in, in navigation because it's something that will impact definitely our, our way of behaving. And I will just close this saying that um, this is something that um, a, some scholars, like for example, a Julie Cohen from the U.S., a, defines as um, as a way as a way of building a sort of a panopticon discipline in the internet, like just using law, using certain structures to build a way of surveilling the individual online. Um, I guess that's a perspective from the user. Um, in a way, though, that is true of users across the internet. I mean, some of those new architectures of controls, I guess, because they come out of businesses as well, um, are put into place cross, cross boundary. Um, criminal law is often more specific to um, a specific country. Um, Paul, could you perhaps say a little bit more on the issues of um, harm that is exported from one country to the other over the internet because of uh, um, the application of criminal laws. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, thank you very much for um, having me here. Um, I think the general tension that we are seeing and um, that we already talked about um, is due to um, the paradox that the internet as such um, is a cross-border architecture. It is not a borderless architecture, it is cross-border, whereas our Westphalian system of states relies upon the notion of geographically physical separated borders. Um, and this is at the root of all this tension that we are seeing. <coughs> um, if you talk about criminal law, you see that there are certain globally accepted standards and norms, for instance, on child pornography. However, the conception of what exactly constitutes a crime can differ among jurisdictions. And as states increasingly assert their jurisdiction also online in cyberspace, um, we see this, we see the impact of, of this tension. For instance, if blasphemy is a crime in one jurisdiction and not in another one, but it's not only this tension, but there's also an, another trend. Things that were not criminal before are now being declared as a crime in some countries. Um, 
for instance, um, if we talk about cyber travel, um, Russia dr um, just drafted a law that would ban or criminalize the use of proxies, whereas, for instance, in New Zealand, um, there is an ISP that offers New Zealand users or customers the right by default to travel virtually in the US jurisdiction and use Netflix. So we see an emerging patchwork. And um, part of this patchwork, on the one hand, we have this patchwork, but on the other hand, we also have growing transboundary impacts due to the assertion of national jurisdiction over online activities. So it's not only crime that can have impacts across borders, but it's also the assertion of jurisdiction of states by law enforcement agencies or courts, or also in the sense of prescriptive jurisdiction, um, that can have transboundary impacts. Um, to take one example um, that we did not talk about yet, um, or that was invoked by Carlos, is criminal copyright. So you see a tendency in criminal law, um, historically, a lot of our international jurisdictional standards are rooted in criminal law, in cross-border uh, in, in, in cross crime. Um, so it's either where the user is placed or where the effects are felt, where states can assert their jurisdiction. Um, however, in the case of um, criminal copyright <coughs> law, we saw this year a lot of cases that point to another direction. If you think, for instance, about the Roja Directa, I don't know how many of you have heard about the Roja Directa case. Oh, yes, yeah, some of you did. So um, the U.S. Um, Customs Enforcement um, sized uh, um, a domain that was registered in .com in the U.S. Um, of a site operated by a Spanish guy that was not declared illegal in Spain. Um, however, as it was operated under a .com domain, the U.S. could assert its jurisdiction under criminal copyright charges and seized this domain and only released it a few weeks ago without further explanation on why they did this. Um, and to give you another example, all of you, I assume, heard about is the um, seizure of MEGA upload. So there again, you have the case where you have a cross-border platform that is operated by a German national who's residing in New Zealand, who's operating a company um, that is incorporated in Hong Kong. Um, however, he uses a US registered .com um, domain and he uses servers that are located in the Netherlands and the larger part in the US. So what the US did there as well was to size the, um, um, the servers and the domain and asserted their jurisdiction um, over the service and the DNS. So on the one hand you have cases that are <coughs> pretty clear in terms of criminal law on the internet where you have for instance a French guy who uses a French service that is regi registered under a .fr domain um, and um, interacts with content that is stored on a French server. It's clear this is a matter if he commits a crime it's a matter of French jurisdiction but for cross-border online activities most part of those activities involve simultaneously a lot of jurisdictions and this poses a problem to the Westphalian system um, that is the basis um, of, of, our, um, of our global order and this creates transboundary impacts especially via the service and the DNS. Thank you Paul. Um, when we were having a conversation earlier you you did also mention that uh, uh, the way th these challenges are spreading is not just because of the behavior of, of states. Uh, companies do also play a role in this, in this whole uh, area as they increasingly cooperate uh, with law enforcement. Could you say a few more words about that as well? <coughs> well, cross-border online platforms are in a very difficult situation because since they constitute a sort of horizontal layer, whereas our jurisdictional Westphalian system is based on, on separation of boundaries and vertical normative orders. Um, those companies span across multiple jurisdictions, so they face the challenge um, to respect the multiplicity of 192 plus different um, local laws and respect and their sensitivities. It's not only about laws, it's also about local sensitivities, and to respect them in their terms of service, as we saw, for instance, with the fact if um, of um, blasphemy as a crime and the innocence of Muslims video. 
Um, so increasingly, I think you could say that um, those cross-border online platforms constitute a sort of digital territory. And the terms of services are increasingly morphing into something. Um, we had, we had a, um, a workshop a few weeks ago at Stanford University where we had um, major civil rights organizations like Electronic Frontier Foundation and Privacy International, but also a lot of US-based cross-border online platforms um, like Twitter, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and so on and so forth. And I would like to share with you um, a very interesting expression. So basically the terms of service for um, at the early days when all those companies were still small startups, um, were sort of cover your ass policy to exclude those companies from liability. So it was just someone, um, they hired a legal expert to just draft something um, in order that they cannot be sued. But at that time, those were small companies who operated in one country who didn't have an international user base um, um, where their users are citizens of multiple jurisdictions. Um, and they increasingly morphed into something um, that one could call or that someone called accidental constitutions. Um, and that was something that Iala uh, mentioned before. Um, for instance, in the case of um, the Innocence of Muslims video, um, Google faced a very difficult um, um, situation because they, had, they received a lot of different requests um, from various jurisdictions, from various agencies, in very heterogeneous forms, so just a request on a piece of paper. And they had to judge whether this was a valid request, um, whether there was a valid legal basis, and whether the person who asked for the takedown of the, um, the video in a given jurisdiction had the authority within the hierarchy of his state or her state um, to do so. Um, and this is not a scaling problem. This is the answer to this problem is not that you just hire more staff to, in order to process all those requests. Um, that would not be a major problem. The problem is that this is a qualitative um, um, problem. Um, yeah. um, thank you, Paul. I think uh, some of what you pointed out um, this, this idea of uh, time, terms of service as constitution almost leads to a new level of law we will be faced with to deal with the criminal law of, of different states. It almost sounds like that, uh, which is more of like a centralization, one could say. Um, Carlos, I think you also have been commenting on how the fragmentation in terms of criminal law might lead to forum shopping when it comes to accusing people uh, of different crimes. Well, the, the background that we have in Latin America right now is, um, I wouldn't say a trend, but perhaps a, a series of cases of uh, defamation conviction against journalists in different countries of the region. So perhaps the most famous case, and some, some of you might, might be aware of it, was the conviction against uh, a newspaper, a director of a, journalist, of a um, newspaper in Ecuador, uh, for def uh, defamation against the president. So the risk that we might be facing right now uh, with, with taking the defamation, uh, the crim this kind of criminal law to the internet is a form shopping uh, because while we have some countries in the region that have decriminalized defamation, most of them haven't, haven't, do it, haven't done it or they have it un under very general conditions. Uh, as happened in Argentina, as happened in Colombia, we have also a case. So that might be a risk that might be unfolding with a problem of jurisdiction, as Paul was saying. Before we move into the third section of the workshop, um, I wanted to uh, see if there's any questions of the floor, but also check, Irla, if you perhaps want to respond to some of these things, because I do think that Google comes up quite a bit, so you should get a an opportunity to react. And also, Nigat, I don't know if you felt that your question about where can users go with this process was answered? Okay, so maybe that's a bit you can also still take up. Um, I suppose, uh, first of all, ultimately I, I agree with what, what Moa says, which is um, uh, that in the long term, um, uh, a key issue actually is for uh, individuals to understand better how the internet works and, and the way it operates um, 
and, and in a way for governments to play a positive role in, in, in leading that process to say we can no longer control the media you know, the way we claimed we could control it in the past, you know, when there were just two TV stations and three newspapers, you know, in, in our country. We've, we've now got this new technology called the Internet. It allows access to global content. Yes, we will find some of that deeply offensive. Yes, some of that will break our law. But governments should not say to their people, we can protect you, we can block all the bad stuff, because that is just not the case, okay? Uh, so I, I agree very much with, with, with that point of view. Um, but but that doesn't stop you know a very difficult situation uh, arising, and I, I suppose the the question if you're running something like YouTube uh, and you have a request say to block one video in a country, um, if you block it, then that video will disappear, but all the other videos will be available. But you may uh, see that as being on the slippery slope um, uh, towards uh, a censorship because maybe there'll be another request tomorrow and then there'll be a hundred requests and then a thousand requests. Um, the other option is to say, no, we don't regard this as a valid request. We want to uh, keep this information available uh, to all the people who use it. Uh, but then you can find your whole platform uh, blocked and then no one in that country can access anything. So it's a very difficult choice and in a way, neither of those um, options are, are particularly good but we you know we have been prepared and Tunisia is, is another example to say to say no uh, to have the entire platform um, uh, blocked uh, and and to suffer the consequences but remember that it's you know YouTube is providing the platform it's users who provide the content and it's other users who want to view it so there's a, a broader um, question of, of shared responsibility uh, I'm sorry if um, uh, you felt that um, YouTube was not uh, contactable um, we, we will have to do better and maybe we can we can talk later on and uh, and figure out how we can we can work better in, in those kinds of situations so I don't, does that answer the <laughs> I think for now it does you um, sir please go ahead he pause the mic please to the gentleman behind the remote uh, the moderator the microphone is there. oh a uh, guy can you please pause on the mic? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is John Duffin from Tanzania. Uh, I would like to know uh, why there is no international agreement or convention on cyber crimes like well I, I know in Europe they have the uh, cyber crime convention and in Africa they are developing a uh, more similar um, convention a uh, regional convention so my, my question is why don't we how uh, the, the international community or the UN doesn't come up with uh, an international convention at least to those uh, agreeable standards that like child pornography is, is a crime per, per se so we have uh, an agreement on certain are crimes that these are, are, are crimes that can be committed on, 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 the, on the internet because the internet has become a, a facilitator of uh, commission of crimes. Thank you. Carlos, no, I would just I would just answer that question from the perspective of the of the inter-American system, and I would give you a short answer. We would have, I mean, I think there's no convention because we would disagree in a lot of points on how how should we move forward and just to give you an example we have a we have a, a guarantee of no prior restraint so much of the problems that have been solved in other jurisdictions have been solved by removing content uh, before it has been acquitted before a judge or before due process has been held in to certain extent and that's indeed a problem for example in adopting some of the proceedings that uh, the US has on copyright uh, removal of content so I would say it's better not to have it right now from the perspective because I like and this is of course my personal opinion what's what what my framework has in my region that one other region might bring to the debate if they are to push forward a convention um, yeah for sure what I mentioned before is that uh, I, I totally uh, agree that the approach to be held in Tunisia, for example, in other Arab countries, is just to educate people about the Internet. But at the same time, when we start 
and we give a solution to, to, the, to, to the government to control a content or, the, or to be able to, to, to delay the content one time, it won't stop. That's a, we know it very well. We, we experienced the same thing with our censorship machine in Tunisia. It's a very efficient one, you know very well. We spend a lot of money on it, but mm. it's not good. And at the end, we found it inefficient. It's supposed to be more efficient than that. And I think it's better to, to say no to, the, to, 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 to countries today according to their national regulation. But you have to know something that uh, in most of, of those countries, there is a, a, a big gap in, in their regulation. If you focus on the case of Tunisia, we, we know that we don't have nothing in our, in our jurisdiction about internet and about uh, cybercrime. We have some few text decrees and, are, and decision, minister decision, but there is no global framework about cybercrime in Tunisia. And so starting to censor or starting to apply for this regulation by Google or by Facebook is really worrying us because you know that, uh, I know, uh, you, you know very well that um, uh, if internet is open in Tunisia, it's not because of the government. The government wants very well to, to, to block the contents, but it is because of the netizens who, who ask it for that, because of the advocacy that had been done through, for many years. And uh, you know very well that, a lot, uh, they, they, that Ben Ali prison, um, put in prison many dissidents, and s some of them were, were, were died because of that. So you, you are not expecting government to protect net freedom. It is the whole citizen, the, the, all, all citizens that have, have, have the real uh, obligation to do ma the mandate. But government had to support that in order to, to, to promote human rights and to promote an internet as an open uh, platform for uh, promote democracy. Uh, yes, hello, my name is Jonathan Zook. <laughs> my name is Jonathan Zook, uh, and I'm with the Association for Competitive Technology. Um, I'm, I'm curious about this tension between uh, an open internet and uh, uh, criminal enforcement, and it, and it seems like it's very easy to have the conversation in the context of uh, defamation, freedom of speech, etc. But, but the very same advocates who are working toward an open internet are the ones that worked so hard to bring about, for example, consumer protection laws inside of so many of these jurisdictions uh, to make sure that companies couldn't sell uh, cars that would uh, uh, that would blow up, or uh, you know that uh, uh, you know uh, food products. Uh, that had bad ingredients in them, et cetera. So the, the, the same advocates, the, the same uh, advocates on behalf of consumers that, that are now crying for an open internet were also the ones advocating for consumer protection. And so uh, let's, let's have the more uncomfortable conversation, which is about enforcement of laws that are designed to protect consumers, not from uh, uh, you know, uh, religiously objectionable videos, but from products that might harm them, et cetera, that, uh, that many jurisdictions have fought long and hard to put in place in the first place. How, how do we reconcile that problem, um, and, and, uh, which is, it seems to me a little less comfortable conversation to have? Um, I saw one more question there in the back. Let's perhaps take that immediately as well so that we can answer both before we go into the last uh, bit. I do think that's a legitimate question which you just asked and it very much feeds into Thank the same you. question of um, why is there no Victor global... Sadosh, I'm here uh, thanks to the initiative Web of Tomorrow is Yours. We represent young people from Europe. Do you, do you hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Victor from Hungary. I I'm, I'm come from a country where the, there is now a proposal of internet blocking and um, there are three main categories. The child uh, abuse online, uh, the criminal act against state and the danger of terror. Uh, could you, like, one by one, di give me a definition of terror? You know, if we if we have if the national security, I mean, if I'm looking, uh, I don't know, angry that I might be, you know, dangerous for someone else. So uh, I see that internet, as you also mentioned, is really a global place, and our governments were elected to run a country, but they were not elected to run uh, uh, the, the internet, which, which is uh, on another level, uh, th it has another layer, but still they, uh, they see, I mean, Google had agreement with the German um, government to ha filter 120 terms on Google search, uh, Russia and other countries. I mean, this is a common, uh, common um, um, behavior now. 
the sea. So other governments also think like, see what they, they do, we can also do something. And um, blocking doesn't help uh, just uh, like for the mainstream users, yes, but internet is interconnecting things. So if you block one connection, there are so many other way around. So uh, I think governments still now experience and then the way you let them do it, as long they can go farther and farther, like a child, you know, if you are not consequent enough, they will go like uh, run the whole family life. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, so in in Germany, um, the availability of of Nazi content or Nazi promotion content is is illegal. Um, we have localized services in Germany, we comply with those laws. If you search in Germany uh, for you know, a website that has that kind of uh, material on it, uh, on Google search, uh, chances are you, you will not find it. Um, uh, what we do do in those situations is we try to uh, inject an element of transparency, so we will put a notice on those searches to tell you what has happened. Uh, under German law, uh, some search results have been removed, um, uh, and we offer a link to the um, uh, Chilling Effects uh, website where people can find out um, uh, a bit more. So that, that's the kind of system we operate. But look, these are really good questions that people are raising. I think, you know, and so we're getting on to w w w how do we get good public policy outcomes here uh, and how do we get outcomes that, that uh, protect the openness of the internet. I think as, as a starting point, I'd suggest it's really important to frame the debate uh, in, in different countries in a positive way. Because if the internet is seen as this alien thing, this foreign technology, you know, that's coming into my country, uh, and it's bringing with it uh, sort of values uh, and content that are uh, deeply offensive, uh, then that will underpin uh, uh, you know, a debate that's driven by controversy uh, that can be led by you know, sort of shrill reporting in the media and we can end up in, in a bad place. So I think there is a job for all of us uh, to do in, in all countries, which is to highlight the positive impacts uh, that the internet has. And sometimes that is, for example, the positive economic impacts, because if a government sees the internet as purely this kind of, um, you know, this revolutionary platform for, um, uh, political commentary, then they may take one view, but if they can see that, for example, it's, it's an engine for positive social or economic impacts, then that can be important to, to frame the debate. And if we can frame the debate in the right way, uh, we, may, we may get to uh, better points. Um, you know, I have plenty more to say in terms of driving good, a good policy, but I, I again go back to what Moaz said earlier. I think educating people about how this actually works and the benefits that it can bring is, is really important. I also think uh, that mobilizing uh, civil society uh, in different countries and different partners to, to take these issues to their own government is, is really important. And that, that is something we try and do in, in, in many countries uh, as well. So I think there, there are a lot of different elements, but we, we can win this debate long term. Um, but I think we have to think clearly about the impact in different countries uh, and how to frame the debate in the right way. Um, Victor raised... Victor raised a very interesting point, um, which is the cross-border nature of the internet, and that was also what Jarla highlighted. I would go even a, w a step further. I would say that the internet is not only a cross-border infrastructure, but it is a common shared infrastructure. It is a global commons. Um, and we all are aware of the benefits um, for mankind that this infrastructure, that is a global commons, has brought to us so far. Um, however, <coughs> however, the tension that we are currently facing is due to the fact that um, our Westphalian system and our jurisdictional system is based on the concept of separation. Managing a shared cross-border infrastructure means that we need to understand how to manage commons, because there is there are transborder impacts at all instances of cross-border online activities. Um, so this management um, requires a sort of cooperation and co-responsibility, but not only between the different governments, but also this is a multi-stakeholder challenge. So um, this requires cooperation by the states, by the platforms, the cross-border platforms, and the users. I would like just to raise a couple of points regarding the first question I think it's it's really crucial 
what you say in terms of what I was mentioning at the beginning, and it's that perhaps many, many of us are not aware that the changes in the internet also mean reconfiguring the social space we live in. I mean, that means reconfiguring our the commerce, our social relationships, education. So up to some point, we're per perhaps very focused on how on, on this concept of the internet while not grasping the whole complexity of it. I mean, e-commerce, uh, security of, of, of um, people, users is also a crucial point uh, in, that, in, that, in that specific area. And I think that's a problem on, on, on many advocators of the open internet and I don't, and I don't, I don't, I don't think I have the, the answer to that question. And it's how should the open internet look like? So we we are perhaps defending an ideal of the open internet, but perhaps we don't know how that e open internet should look like if it was to address all the concerns we have. And a small uh, point regarding terror, I think we should bear in mind the the clear problem of the rhetoric of fear, uh, of 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 pushing criminal law or pushing regulation. In, in different in different aspects of, of, of life, and that's and that rhetoric of fear is something that is definitely driving an important debate in the internet. So you can see it. I, I'm currently living in the UK, and the rhetoric of fear is crucial. For example, to push uh, the CCTV programs, which are seriously challenged with very serious evidence if they really work, if they don't work, um, because it's also it's also a business and it's also a, an ideological standpoint. So. I think we should bear in mind th those things when we are going to assess uh, critically the criminal law that we're discussing for the for the internet. I need to be back to yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, the government had to f focus a lot on security, on national security, especially during the regime of Ben Ali. Yeah, and this is I think they lost a lot of opportunities. And this is our mandate today, together with private sector, to, to, to show them how many opportunities they lost. And that is the key issue. If we remain focusing on blocking and, and cyber security and uh, comparing internet just on, on, as a threat, considering as a, as a threat, we want to be able to take to this opportunity and to, do, to develop the internet in Tunisia. So this is my comment about it. Um. I'm just, uh, I mean, I think some of the comments that have been made are already asking the question of, so what is the way forward? Clearly there are certain concerns where perhaps criminal law and national jurisdiction still are the first way to solve those genuine concerns. Uh, clearly there are issues that perhaps need, need a global solution and that solution hasn't been given. I, I must say I really like Carlos's point that maybe um, the way to solve this, the starting point perhaps should be to, to rethink what we think of as a free and open internet and what that means. Maybe we've not been creative enough in thinking through what that is in the future rather than what it was 10 years ago. Um, I don't know what the possibilities are, but I definitely think it's an important uh, starting point. It could be an interesting thought process. Um, I know that... Uh, um, in terms of resolving that direction, the, the tension more concretely, Tunisia has been uh, taking some important steps uh, in the new regime. Moes, can you tell us a bit more? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to mention that Tunisia seeks for sure an open, uh, interoperable, secure and reliable information and communication infrastructure. That's something that is a concern of, uh, still, still a concern in, in my country. But we also, after the revolution, we say that, okay, we need to do reforms about the internet and about how internet is governed. So we include, we open the door to civil societies and we try to, to make a difference with what, and, to, and to transform uh, the, um, how people think about the internet. So it's not just uh, reform, regulation, regulation and re reforms in terms of jurisdiction, but it's also uh, in go deep in their mind and people and, and try to explain things. So um, we started by, by the ITI. You know, the Tunisian Internet Agency is, uh, let me say, is a historical part of the Internet of Tunisia. It's the, 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 the agency that was in charge of everything regarding the Internet for years. So it's a mono-stakeholder mono uh, or organism or, or structure that, is, that is, was in charge of censorship, of surveillance, of Internet development. But initially, it is an Internet exchange point. Of course, we are not recognized by, in the, by, by the other internet exchange point as we don't have peering and we don't uh, have applying the best practices. So after 
the revolution, it was for us very important to, to move forward and to keep the ITI because a lot of persons, or political figures and civil society asked to, to abolish the ITI. We, took, we, we had a lot of pressure also from different um, consultancy companies who worked for uh, banks uh, were, uh, for for different for, for the government and tried to advise the government okay, to 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 abolish the, the agency, but we kept in mind that it, if you abolish the agency, it is that you abolish or you destroy the, the only the unique internet exchange point in the North Africa region. We don't have a lot of internet exchange points, if you know. In in in, in 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 Morocco, we don't have one. In Algeria, in Libya, and Tunisia, we don't. We have only the internet exchange point. It is ITI. So we, we advised the ministry at that time, since uh, after the election, that ITI cannot play an, a role in cybersecurity. We are here for the, for the, for the internet development, so we need to, be, to keep our, our, main, our main role as an internet exchange point and also work for the domain names development, that's it. So the government applied for that and now we are uh, dealing with a global reform for uh, cyber security in order to create another agency or make a, a law regarding the cyber crime or something like that. But it's very, very worrying because we need to keep safeguards. What, what is worrying me, you know that Tunisia adopted the declaration of net freedom made by the coalition of countries and we are and we organized the net freedom conference in june 2013 so it's very uh, opportunity for government and for civil society in tunisia to understand what is net freedom and also to guide the government to put safeguards on the constitution and the other laws this is our concern you know f for sure that iti will move forward toward uh, to towards the internet exchange point uh, role but at the same time we keep advising the, the government to, to also go in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the good direction and to move in the, in the good direction in order to prevent uh, any uh, violation of human rights. Because we know that very well that internet couldn't be developed if uh, human rights are not ensured. We experienced that for years and internet in Tunisia lost a lot of opportunities. We know that very well. Thank you. I think that wasn't... Uh, that was an experience from the national level. Um, Carlos, you were earlier talking about um, how some of the changes that take place also normalize a new kind of behavior on the internet, which is part of that tension between criminal law and the free and open internet. Do you think that, for example, the uh, Inter-American Convention on Human Rights is an instrument that could help push back against some of these things? Is that where one of the solutions lies? Well, one of the, of the things that we have been doing in the, in the CELE Center of the Palermo University in Argentina is trying to, to explore these issues under the light of the Inter-American Humans Convention. Um, and, we have, and we have come to the conclusion that although we might not solve the problems, it's really useful to al at least analyze them. And just to mention one point uh, that might, might, might help, uh, proportionality. Proportionality is a very important uh, criteria to analyze any kind of regulation under the Inter-American Human Rights Commission. And I, mean, I know we didn't invent this. I mean, this is something which is used in several legislations and judicial systems. But the point is that this has been key to analyze um, the way some criminal laws in physical space have been used to chill freedom of expression. So perhaps this might, might give a framework uh, to at least lay, level the playing field to make the debate on how we should move forward in a regional way. And I think, to add and to end um, this point, this might also give some keys to other aspects that are, that, are, that are not related exclusively with law but might be useful as self-regulation processes. I mean, uh, in, 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 this, in this criteria of proportionality, of self-restraint, of um, criteria to make uh, legislation, we might also find some ways to design self-regulation procedures that might help public policy instead of just thinking that criminal law will solve problems as complex as the ones that uh, Moes was describing. Ilya, you mentioned earlier that you had lots of things to say about how to make good public policy. Can you say a few more things? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I hope it didn't come out that way. Um, <laughs> um, well, it was very interesting what Victor, who was just leaving, 
uh, sorry, uh, Victor. Um, uh, I I in terms of, you know, we see many proposals around the world uh, for filtering, for example. And very often they start with child abuse material, okay? Um, and it's hard to argue against that. Uh, but I think we have to. Um, because um, what we need for good public policy is we need a clear problem and we need a good solution. Uh, and very often when you drill down into uh, these kinds of proposals it's not clear what the problem that they're trying to address is uh, or how this particular filter will actually solve it. Uh, often these things are much more driven by political considerations or responding to media pressure. Uh, we need to ask those hard questions, we need to try and force governments to, to address uh, those issues. Uh, very often if we get a filter that is initially narrowly targeted, this can very quickly expand. Okay, so first of all it's child abuse material, now what about terrorism, uh, what about very violent content and suddenly we're on the road to uh, filtering and blocking uh, huge varieties of content. So it's, it's really, really important to have the battle at the first instance uh, and not let these systems um, get, get established. Um, look, another element I think that needs to be injected here is a realism about the, how the internet actually works. And that goes to the effectiveness of some of these systems. Um, you know, you block uh, one video, well maybe 10 or 100 or 1,000 other videos will come along instantly that will show the same. And Moaz is absolutely right. Sometimes the effect of blocking a thing can be just to make it more popular. Uh, surely that isn't the, the effect the government wanted to have, but that can often be the, the effect uh, that, that they will achieve. Um, so governments need to understand how the, how the internet works. Uh, and I think you know, industry and civil society have a very important role to play here in terms of engaging with government uh, in a rational manner to talk about these things from a position of saying, yes, there are bad things, there is bad content, we want a solution that protects the people in our country, but we want real effective solutions, not things that kind of look good uh, and, and are just designed to kind of keep, um, uh, you know, keep things off the front page of the newspaper. Uh, well, a, a line I've heard you use earlier, uh, or a question I heard you raise earlier, Erla, was uh, are we making policy or are we doing politics? And I think that's often a very good distinction in this field. Unfortunately, a lot of it seems to be about politics rather than policy. Um, Paul, I know that uh, one of the solutions, I think, or ways forward you envision are uh, standards that would apply not just across jurisdictions but also across businesses. Um, would that mean that exercises that happen at the Internet Governance Forum amongst others of developing Internet Governance principles of various kinds could be a, a way as well to push this whole debate? Um, <coughs> well, first of all, let me say it's not... Over the last two years um, we saw a lot of internet governance principles emerging. Um, and if you look at them, you, you see certain patterns emerging. And um, as you know, I'm working for the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, which is a global multi-stakeholder dialogue process on exactly how to address this tension between the cross-border nature of the internet and geographically defined national jurisdictions. And, um, we identified a certain set of shared norms that all stakeholder groups might possibly agree on as a result of our ongoing dialogue, um, which is availability, so the broadest possible availability of content that is legal, the respect of granularity, as we heard before, um, YouTube was blocked in Tunisia for a very long time just because two videos on the whole platform infringed Tunisian law. Um, yeah, I want to mention uh, that, that without any law, it is the decision of the Ben Ali regime. So it's not uh, just because of one of so the videos showed the Ben Ali and okay. To informal decisions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but but um, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Sometimes. Uh, that situation can arise through legal channels also. That was the case in, in Turkey, where there were videos um, uh, criticizing Ataturk. This is illegal in Turkey, so we had valid court orders, uh, which we did not, not prepare to act on. Uh, and so, we don't, we don't okay, but, but I'm just saying in, in some countries, you can have a situation where it is driven by law. There is valid legal process. Um. <laughs> 
And um, I think another very important principle um, or shared norm for all stakeholders is transparency. Um, the transparency of procedures, exactly what we just had. We have on the one hand countries where we have informal requests by some government agencies or ministries, whereas on the other hand we have requests, um, formal requests by law enforcement um, authorities or courts. But those procedures are often not really traceable, not very well documented, and um, also not interoperable. Because, uh, again, if you take the perspective of a cross-border platform, you receive all those requests um, from all different jurisdictions and all those diverse forms um, that, we, that we just um, heard of. Um, so there's a lack of interfacing procedures between not only jurisdictions in terms of cooperation in online crime, but also in terms of the cooperation between jurisdictions and cross-border online platforms. And lastly, and this is a major um, issue, I think, is um, the need for due process. So really a clarity of procedures for takedown, for law enforcement, um, access to private identifiers or private data, um, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I think in a way some of that also comes back to the question of the gentleman from Tanzania earlier. On some of these issues, perhaps we do still need to find the best platform to, on, on a specific issue, develop some of these shared norms and processes and et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, that's a very good pitch. I would like to invite you because um, the Internet and Jurisdiction Project is hosting um, two workshops. Um, one will take place this afternoon on frameworks for cross-border online communities and services at 4.30 and the other one will take place tomorrow at 2.30. There was a shift of schedule on the geography of cyberspace, so the overlap between physical territories and um, the cross-border nature of the Internet and the infrastructure of the Internet. So um, there is really a need for a structured dialogue in this, and um, I invite you all to participate. Thank you. I already see three fingers. Uh, the lady here was first, if somebody can get a mic to her, and then Guy and the gentleman over there. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Athena Fraguli, and I'm from the RIPE NCC. Actually, I wanted to mention your point you just made, that it, because, okay, what is crime and what is not, it's a big, you know, um, yeah, it's a big discussion. And, you know, different uh, jurisdictions, what's crime in one jurisdiction, what's not in the other jurisdiction. This, this is a discussion that has, um, you know, it happens outside the internet too. It's, it's nothing new, right? Of course, in internet, the cross-border element is there. Uh, so it happens more often, it's easier to happen. Um, so, of course, the LEA, uh, the law enforcement authorities, have to cooperate. And, yeah, when it comes to, you know, to, to, to clearly, uh, to clear crimes, let's say, like, pornography, uh, you know, child pornography and things like that. The private se sector wants also to help. I mean, this is, this is um, unacceptable. This is something that creates this, uh, this sense of, uh, I have to do something. It's my moral duty, let's say. But, indeed, we see that the procedures we have to uh, adhere to are very poor. The legal basis is vague, is not good. And this leads to a uh, lack of trust. And internet is cooperation, is transparency, is trust. So if, if the users see that, they'll move to a different platform. It's simple. Th th they'll do something else. It, it's like the power base, like, you know, they'll, they'll move to different countries, to move different jurisdictions. This is how it happens. So. In order to, to get this trust, we need clear procedures and transparent ones, of course, and clear legal basis. Thank you. Let's first take all the questions and maybe don't have responses, okay? Uh, uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, it's uh, Lala, uh, Yala. Um, 
Yerle, uh, um, so uh, you 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 have, you follow the law in Germany and you take down Nazi or links to Nazi, but in Turkey you you don't follow the law. So uh, clearly you are bringing other criteria to bear as to when you will follow the laws or when you don't. So maybe you could just uh, tell us a bit more about the kind of criteria that you do bring. Thank you. The gentleman in the back. Uh, this is a question for Paul. So you spoke about treating the internet as a sort of global commons as a way of regulating cross-border spillover effects. To me, that is not the most apt analogy because I, the internet is clearly a transboundary phenomenon, but I don't think you can call it a classic global commons. I don't want to be pedantic about it, and perhaps this is something that will get addressed tomorrow on the ge uh, geography of the internet, but the fact that it is fundamentally a territorialized system, which can consists of physical infrastructure in places and users in places. And where I'm going with this question is that I think one of the things that gets lost in a lot of these conversations is that national communities, especially ones where you have strong democratic polities, can very legitimately make different kinds of decisions uh, about what's in, and out, in or out, right? And we've, we've talked about Germany and Nazi content, and I think that's a, a, a legitimate decision. So I feel that some of these conversations need to move down from the global into the local, which is where democracy happens, which is where people do make choices about what kind of community they want to live in. And I think that the internet has to be reflective of some of those norms. So that's obviously very challenging, but something to chew on, perhaps. Um, Paul, why didn't you go? Okay, so I will respond to, to both questions. I will, I will start um, with yours. So um, what you just said is that <coughs> the internet is, is cannot be perceived as a global commons um, due to the fact that um, we have servers based in, in, in some jurisdictions um, the internet can be very physical of a, consisting of cables and servers um, I would say um, that the internet as such was not conceived as a territorial infrastructure the internet as such does not know any physical borders. Um, I'm sure this will be the subject of the debate tomorrow and there will be plenty of room to debate all those um, um, questions. Um, but I th think um, what is important um, to understand that is that the internet basically consists out of three layers. So you have what you just mentioned, the physical layer which includes the cables and the servers and so on and so forth. This is very physical and there are n natural choke points of course. However, a second layer is the logical layer of the internet which is the numbering and naming system of the internet and the protocols and they do not know any borders um, this is a human-made infrastructure where borders have not been programmed into the internet um, of course it is the choice of mankind to re-establish those borders in cyberspace and it you can argue that it is the legitimate right of states to do so and to enforce their national jurisdiction to the fullest on online activities. However, you would change the nature of the internet and you would change the internet that we are accustomed to and our children, um, you, you would tell at some point our children in the future and grandchildren about the internet that, that was once free and um, where different cultures were interacting online on a regular basis in, in everyday normal life interactions. But this is an open question, um, so um, I'm sure this will be addressed tomorrow in more detail. And um, coming back um, to your question, you raised um, um, very interesting points. I completely agree with um, what you said about the lack of, of procedures, um, procedural interfaces, um, and so on and so forth. But I would like to, to highlight one special point, because you said, you, you highlighted um, the fact that um, there's a huge disagreement between different cultures um, about norms, about what is a crime and what is not a crime. And this is legitimate. Um, however, the challenge that we are facing um, in relation to the Internet is, and I argue it is a global commons, uh, is, to, sh is to, to, to manage a common infrastructure. And um, 
a point that I raised um, um, earlier when I talked about um, the seizure of mega upload and the application of national sovereignty over the logical layer, so the DNS, but also the physical layer in terms of the server location, which is an, a question that is very important if you talk about cloud computing, is basically that um, you could say, and I'm provocative here, that sovereignty kills sovereignty. So if you think about it, the assertion of your national jurisdiction can have adverse transboundary impacts on the citizens of other countries just because on your territory um, um, you have the servers of a cross-border online platform or your upper, your, the domain that is widely used by the internet community because it has a nice ending um, um, is located on your territory and it is your legitimate right to do so. However, what you provoke is a situation where other countries see this as a justification to do exactly the same and they will start to also assert their jurisdiction to the fullest um, on the infrastructure of the internet. Um, and if this is happening, your citizens will also feel the impact. Maybe it is in the form of limited availability of content, for instance, um, so that um, some services your, your citizens are using have been taken down by another jurisdiction. So this is what I, what I referred to before, the notion of um, cooperation and the need for um, co-responsibility to, to manage um, this infrastructure and to address um, the tension between the, the cross-border nature of the internet and national jurisdictions. Thank you, Paul. Ila, I think one of the questions was also specifically directed at you. Yeah, the, um, the question of um, when a service is, is localized uh, or subject to law in an individual country um, is essentially a pretty complex um, legal question and it's around uh, jurisdiction. I'm not a lawyer um, uh, but um, uh, and, and that can vary by country, it can vary by the type of service, it can vary by how and, uh, and when people access it. Um, but the kind of things that I think are significant into that decision are number one, where is the data hosted for this service um, and if it's hosted in the country, that can be a very significant factor uh, in bringing that service within uh, the scope of local law. Uh, another significant factor is the domain uh, that the service is, um, is on, whether it's a local domain or whether it's <coughs> excuse me, a, a dot .com domain, which is a, a global platform. Uh, and a third factor actually for organizations is, uh, I do we have a, a local company operating a business uh, in this country? That can also be significant. Uh, and finally, I'd say uh, the presence of local staff uh, can be a factor, uh, particularly when you're concerned not to have them arrested and dragged off to jail. And that's, you know, that's uh, into the more sort of pragmatic uh, domain. So obviously companies have to be careful where you set up local services and where you set up local offices and, and where you have people. Thank you, Ila. Any more questions or comments from the floor? Uh, just to, to mention that the Freedom House report, Freedom on the Internet 2011-2012, mentioned Tunisia and uh, as a significant score change, plus 35. So it is really worthy to, to mention and we still, and we, <laughs> thank you very much. But we are looking forward also to see Tunisia next, next year among the free countries. Thank you. Uh, I'm very reluctant to uh, sum up, especially the challenges. Uh, I'm sure we haven't covered all, though we might have made a beginning. I, I do think what comes out very strong in terms of solutions is that we need much better uh, processes to start with, both within criminal law as such, as well as with businesses and far more transparency around these things. I also think to some extent, clearly, we need a new imagination and get more creative around what things could mean. Um, and finally, if I may add one point which, which didn't come out somewhat to my surprise that strongly, though I think Carlos hinted at it, maybe we also need higher standards. I think among civil society, when I have discussions with uh, um, people from other parts of the region, increasingly I feel that the inter-American system in many ways is actually an example and I find it really striking to see how the courts there sometimes uh, give judgments with, which we wouldn't even think of being able to achieve. Um, so I guess it comes, it fits both the imagination, but also the fact that we have instruments like uh, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
which actually sets standards which criminal law often doesn't live up to sufficiently, even in, even in democratic countries and even in places where there is often a lot of acceptance around how things have played out. That doesn't mean we shouldn't stop pushing. Just very quickly before we leave, I wanted to uh, ask all participants to just very briefly, one line or two lines, say what is, what is the hope for the future? Well, I would, I would just say briefly that um, I'm a little pessimistic about how the, the debate's been unfolding, but I would say that uh, the human rights framework is, is starting to understand how the Internet works, which was something that you all said, which is a basic thing. And if we manage to translate highly technical debates into the rights language, and if we manage to start making sound policy without just being grounded in, 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 the, in the internet that we knew 10 years ago, we might actually defend uh, some sort of open internet that we have to start devising in a very clear way. Well, I think, <clears throat> I think we are faced with a general challenge um, that um, actually, um, we have a 17th century um, framework which was created by the Treaty of Westphalia that is um, regulating how we coexist um, and how, how, how we talk about um, how jurisdiction is structured um, and how, how states function and how the global order is, is, um, is maintained. Um, and to address this tension that the 21st um, century technology of the internet um, is creating, I think what we need to have is, 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 is a structural multi-stakeholder dialogue process on how to move forward and how to manage this global commons. Well, you didn't quite do it, but does that also mean advocating for the end of the nation state? Let's not get into that. <laughs> I would love to talk about this. No, no, no. It's, it, it does not mean the goal is, n is not to replace something and the internet, I think, um, um, the answer to the problems we are facing is not um, the harmonization of, of all laws. Um, that's an illusion. Um, I think the emphasis that I would like to make is really on how to manage the global commons. So what principles do we need to establish to, to enable the peaceful coexistence in cyberspace? And what interoperable procedures do we need in order to maintain the internet, but also to regulate it, of course, which is needed to a certain extent? Okay. Um, I'm really optimistic, instead of uh, my friend from Argentina. I say that, say that what uh, Mr. Frank Laurie was, was supposed to be with us today, uh, internet will prevail as open as possible. So we will do whatever to, to, to let it be like this and to prevail. Thank you. Um, I think, um, and yeah, you, you mentioned uh, transparency as being uh, really important. We, we agree. I just want to give a mention to a transparency report that we publish where you can see the number of requests we get to remove content from different countries. Uh, and we think that's important to, to bring this kind of activity out into the open um, uh, just so people can understand what, what's going on. Um, in terms of policy debates, we, we have to fight. And we have to fight country by country. And we have to be smart and we have to win those battles because that is really, really important. If we don't win those battles, what we end up with is a series of national and regional different internets uh, which will fracture this global commons uh, that is so dynamic and, and, and so um, important. Um, uh, and yes, I'm very hopeful. Great, fight country by country and perhaps all of us together as well across boundaries. Uh, thank you very much everybody for being her here with us this morning and for all the interesting questions and comments. A very special thanks of course to all the speakers um, and as well to anybody who has been on the remote participation. Thank you. <laughs>